So as I've mentioned, this is the fourth part of a series about making peace during the dog days of summer. Remember, the dog days have nothing to do with literal dogs or being hot as a dog or something like that. It has to do with the presence of the constellation uh, Canis Major, the big dog in the sky, and the, the dog star Sirius, which ancient people believed would add extra heat during summertime and make, maybe make people's blood boil, which the, especially the Romans thought was good for waging war. So instead of studying war, we've intentionally been studying peace. Remember, we started out by exploring how to use the means of grace to establish peace within ourselves. And then we moved on to learning the lessons of a feuding twin brothers, Jacob and Esau, to develop peace within our family. Last week, we committed to openness and mutual care, grow peace in our communities, especially our Windermere church community. And now, today, we come to the big one. How do we make peace that stretches around the whole world? Especially peace between hostile nations. I don't have a good answer for that, actually. But maybe a wish-granting genie would help. I was thinking about uh, this question and this concept, and I thought about the, the show The X-Files. Have, have any of you watched The X-Files before? It's a show from the late 90s into the 2000s that follows two FBI agents as they investigate Cases that defy 20th century science and logic and usually involve supernatural monsters or ghosts or especially extraterrestrial aliens. Lots of aliens in the X-Files. Well, there was one episode in which Agent Mulder discovered a genie who grants wishes, but in a very mischievous way particularly ways that will cause troubles for the genie's master at the time, sometimes bodily harm. Well, Agent Mulder, upon somehow becoming the genie's master himself, figures that he can get around the genie's mischief by making wishes that are totally for other people. And so Mulder wishes for peace in the world. And he looks around, doesn't hear anything, doesn't see anything different. And he goes and looks out the window of his apartment, which is several stories up. He sees that the street has gotten awfully quiet. It's because the genie has caused all the people, at least on his street in Washington, D.C., to vanish. Clearly, the genie and the show writers make the point that as long as there are humans who are interacting with each other, peace in the world is impossible. What about you, friends? Do you think world peace is possible? Or, or do we need to lower our standards a bit? Like, maybe we can just settle for the prevention of World War III. You know, even that extremely low bar has felt nearly impossible at times. And simply to prevent nuclear bombs from killing millions of people in the blink of an eye, we've accepted policies like mutually assured destruction as necessary real politique. The world's messed up. And it's been that way for a long time. 
know, the, the prophet Isaiah didn't have to worry about nuclear bombs going off, but he did have other major worries back in the 8th century before Christ. A lot of people during the prophet Isaiah's time were worried about the Assyrian Empire. Have any of you heard of the, the Assyrian Empire? You probably heard of it back in your maybe universities, maybe even back even further. The Assyrians were the evil empire of the 8th and 7th century BCE. They, they had their capital in Nineveh. You might have heard of Nineveh from the story of Jonah. Yes, that's those people. Well, eventually, the Assyrians, led by the dread warrior king, Sennacherib, would destroy the northern Hebrew kingdom of Israel and come to dominate the southern kingdom of Judah. But before that happened, the Israelites, the people that worshipped God, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, knew to fear the Assyrians because of the Assyrians' reputation for separating the families of conquered nations and scattering them to the far corners of their increasingly large empire. The Israelites knew that they didn't stand a chance of survival in open warfare against the Assyrians, at least not on their own. Some thought that maybe with the right alliances with some of the other small nations of the region, and you know, showing just a little bit of willingness to worship their allies' gods uh, alongside with their own, maybe they could stand and fight. Yet when God spoke to the Israelites through the prophets, prophets like Isaiah, God emphatically said, no, no more war. Of course, God said no to worshiping other gods. You know, that's, that's the first commandment, right? Thou shalt not have any gods before me. That's pretty basic stuff. The ancient Israelites had an awfully hard time, even with that Yet God didn't only judge unfaithful religious acts. God judged the dependence on money and brutal oppression of vulnerable people. Those were the things that really upset God. And God judged their chosen people for abandoning the peace that God had established. God's divine shalom in order to compete with other nations in the region. That's what upset God. You know, if you read the rest of Isaiah, you know, beyond the parts that we especially hear at Advent and Christmas times, we hear an awful lot of prophecies that are judgment on God's people. Chapter 1 begins with God calling the heavens and the earth as witnesses against God's own people saying, I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. Ah, oh, sinful nation, people laden with iniquity, offspring who do evil, children who deal corruptly, who, who have forsaken the Lord, who have despised the Holy One of Israel, who are utterly estranged. How about that for a disturbance of one's peace? And chapter 2, after the reading that we heard uh, Justin offer us, we hear can, some continued judgments. God continues to judge the Israelites' endless supply of treasure and chariots and idols, ending with, with God's people hiding in caves and crevices, quote, from the terror of the Lord and from the glory of God's majesty when God rises to terrify the earth, unquote. Isaiah sounds a little bit like a fire and brimstone preacher there, right? Yet in between the judgment, 
there is divine promise. Isaiah saw that the nations would come to Mount Zion, where God's holy temple was, in the holy city of Jerusalem, to be taught the ways of God. And the, the world's warriors would make garden tools out of their weapons. In a word, from God's temple would come world peace. The biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann sum summarizes Isaiah's point like this. The harsh judgments announced by the prophet are roughly matched by promises that anticipate that after the judgment of Yahweh upon the city of Jerusalem, there will be a renewal and restoration. The promises testify to Yahweh's capacity to make new upon judgment. Friends, it's not the kings or the armies or, the, or even the priests and the prophets that would bring peace. God alone would bring peace in God's own time. Have we learned the lessons of Isaiah for world peace? Well, especially since February of this past year, I've heard multiple pieces on CBC in which military commanders and policy wonks will cry out, our Canadian defense budget is far too small. Our fighter jets are out of date. Our tanks aren't big enough. How could we possibly survive if Russia or China were to attack us? And I suppose they do have a point. An attack by Russia would be very scary, for sure. You know, how can one not feel some amount of fear in the face of brutality of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you know? Yet I can't help but hear the echoes of ancient history. Isaiah knew that the Assyrians were scary people. And Isaiah still preached that God would judge the nations, who would, res who would respond to God's judgment by disarming and learn peace instead of war. Friends, surely World War III would be terrifying. But instead of building up our air forces and navies and armies, surely God wants us, as Isaiah preached, to seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. You know, I don't have any magic solution for world peace to offer today. That should be pretty obvious by now. I simply have the conviction that we follow a God who would prefer to become human and die at the hands of evil empire instead of starting a new world war. And somehow, despite all that, God still comes out victorious. My beautiful people of Windermere United Church, world peace is the sole responsibility of the Lord God Almighty, who is Alpha and Omega, who is and who was, and who will, who is to come. Alleluia, amen. But I can't in good conscience end the sermon by neglecting any responsibility for building peace between nations throughout the world. As much as I am convinced that, that, the, it is, that world peace is God's work to complete, I have simply observed that God prefers to work through God's creatures to attain God's ends. 
That means all of us. So what small parts do we play in God's global peacemaking project? First of all, we should pray. I believe that prayer is powerful. And I confess that I, I don't understand the power of prayer. Yet I can witness to the power of prayer individually and around the world. So friends, please pray. Pray individually. Pray with family. Pray with, with co-workers, with neighbors, with, with strangers on the street if you got enough gumption. If you'd like some guidance about how to pray, I'd be glad to talk with you further. But please pray for peace around the world. Another thing that we can do to build world peace is advocate. God does have a preferred future for her omniscient mind. And a lot of our job as people of faith is to advocate for God's preferred future. Obviously, various peoples of faith disagree about what exactly that future will look like. Yet we as members and adherents and friends of the United Church of Canada can look to our regional councils and general council to learn what specific policies we should advocate for as followers of the way of Jesus Christ. And we especially here at Windermere Church are blessed with folks who know those policies very, very well, and they would be glad to talk with you about them. But there's a third way as well, maybe the simplest way that we can build world peace, and that is through our community witness. The way we live as followers of the way of Jesus is its own witness for world peace. Our, for example, our public, intentional, and explicit affirmation of sun celebration of, of two-spirit and LGBTQ plus people is a witness for the world around us. As is our, our lovely pollinator garden out there, showing that we make peace even with our tiniest buzzing neighbors. And as is our, our work on behalf of and with our neighbors and friends of the Swansea Muse. People look at us as Windermere United Church. They overhear us singing and praying and talking, and they learn what God's peace is about. World peace will come because God brings it to fruition. And God will use each of us in that grand global mission as we open ourselves to God's will and empowerment. So indeed, let there be peace on earth. And let it begin with us. The people of God say, Amen.